excuse me for putting film through a camera so it's costing money. As soon as you see the camera starts coming to you, like, you move across, like, because that's meant to be John, all right? The camera is John for now. Scene one, take one, from the video of a pop song heading for the charts. Like, I want to see you turn to, no, turn suddenly, it's like, oh, it's... And these are the sounds of that record being born. It's being created by Mike Stock and Matt Aitken, Britain's most successful songwriters. For years, they've been able to take the country's musical pulse and deliver hit after hit. It's made them both multi-millionaires. Stock and Aitken have just produced their 16th number one record. Today, in their early 40s, they're worth about 40 million pounds each. It's been an astonishing achievement for two lads from humble beginnings. We were poor, quite poor. In fact, uh, the first home that we had was a prefab, which was kind of these things they put up after the war. I actually don't remember thinking that we were poor, but looking back on some of the photographs, and uh, you, you look like, you know, some of the famine relief programs you see. We didn't have a vacuum cleaner and uh, that one of these to have to clean the carpets with a dustpan and brush and all this sort of thing. I was very, very insulted once when a, a teacher at our secondary school and sociology was one of the up and coming subjects said to me, uh, describe me as working class. And I got upset by that. Nowadays it's quite fashionable to think of yourself that way, isn't it? But I was determined to pretend I was middle class, you know. My father was musical. He taught the accordion when he was younger, and my mother could play the piano. We didn't have a record player in the house, I think we probably had a radio. And when we moved to the, with my grandmother, there was a, a small upright piano there. That was in the parlour, and I'd go in and make a racket. <laughs> From the very earliest stage, everyone used to get me to sing. In fact, I made a record when I was about 12, 11 or 12, uh, with the school. Um, and I have tape recordings of, of me playing guitar and playing piano and all those things going back, you know, to, to when I was six and seven. And, uh, and I wrote songs when I was seven. And my mum's kept them, actually, uh, in, a, in a folder. And every, every single song was written out in hand, by hand by me and with illustrations for some reason. It was always something that fascinated me. My idols were the Beatles, and when I was nine, they really hit the big time and, and invaded my life. But prior to that, I was doing it, so it's a bit... It's not as if I can say they kicked it off, but uh, they certainly you know, carried me along. I listened to Radio Luxembourg, and during the sort of... just after the Beatles had arrived, I suppose, the Rolling Stones, Dave Clark Five, The Monkees, that sort of late 60s era. My, my first real desire to play music was, I went on a camping holiday, I was about 15, and there was a guy there who was actually a Mauritian, his name was Suryananda, which I always thought of his name. And we used to sit around the campfire and he had this acoustic guitar and we used to you know, sing these folky songs. I thought it was marvellous what I could do that. So I went home and I said, I'd like a guitar. And uh, my mother said, well, if you want to learn to play music, you have to learn to play the piano. Uh, which I didn't really want to do. Even I, was sort of, I, I used to play boogie-woogie in the blues, uh, even though I, I had no formal training. And, uh, and that was the deal, basically. I had to take piano lessons. So I took piano lessons for a couple of years, and eventually I got my hands on an acoustic guitar. I initially bought myself a, a couple of microphones, attached one to a stand so I could play a guitar, so the microphone picked up the acoustic guitar, one in my mouth so I could sing, and a little rhythm box. And I also had a little keyboard that I, I managed to buy. So I went out gigging on my own, into pubs and uh, working men's clubs. 
and actually I did very well. I started earning some decent money, and this is sort of a, a mid mid seventies. I started to earn fifteen pounds per gig, so you know, started to be able to save up a bit. By this time, Mike and Matt were separately earning a living playing gigs. Sheer chance brought them together. I'd sacked the, the guitarist yet again for being drunk and falling over on stage. And uh, I was left without a guitarist, and obviously I was working every night of the week virtually. So the girl singer said, well, I, I know someone who's just come off a cruise. Uh, I can get him in tomorrow night, see if you like him. I got a call, can he do uh, Kensington Roof Garden? Was it Kensington Roof Garden? One of the Kensington Hotel, can you can do 6.30 tonight? And it wasn't working. I had a chat in the pub. And, uh, and we set the gear up in the ballroom, and I said, look, come upstairs. If, if you know the songs, you're in. Ten years ago, they decided to take the gamble of stopping the gigs. It was New Year's Eve 1983. I said to Matt and the rest of the band, look, I'm knocking the gigs on the head. I'm taking no more bookings for the new year. New Year's Eve is our last gig at the Royal Lancaster Hotel. I'm gonna, I've got enough money put by that I can last 18 months. Uh, I'm going into the studio and I'm not coming out until we're successful, you know, and we've made it in the big time. The rest of the band got jittery and went, went their own way and said, the drummer said, well, I'm gonna go and get a gig here and the singer went over there and, and all that. But Matt said, I'll, go, I'll have a go with you. And so we went down the studio in January 1984, and by February, I took a tape, Matt and I took a tape in to Pete Waterman. With Waterman, an expert on the business side of pop music, they formed the now legendary threesome Stock, Aitken, Waterman. He was the, uh, the headmaster and we were the schoolboys at first because he knew the ropes. In fact, we were kind of a little bit lost the first time we uh, uh, started making records together, but we, you know, we. But by, by, by perspiration and perseverance, we, we got through the, the job. I was born to be helpless, I was born to be cold, I was born to never. Their first hit was with the outrageous and now late drag artist, Divine. But of all the things, I was born to be cheap, cheap, cheap. I was born to be cheap. Before it went out, Divine's candle burnt brightly with a song called You Think You're a Man. But the team's first major hit was with the group Dead or Alive from Liverpool. Simon Bates picked up on the record on Radio 1 and he said, I think this is phenomenal and I'm going to play this every day till it's a hit. And Simon Bates played it every day on Radio 1 for about three weeks and suddenly it just happened. The record just happened and once it went it exploded. Over the next few years they had 114 records in the top 40, 15 of them at number one and 49 in the top five. It brought them countless awards and serious money. Today, Matt lives in a million pound house once owned by Dirk Bogart. It's a fantastic home. It's got lots of character. Uh, it's got enough uh, enough land for the dog to run around. You know, we keep deer. Ozzy Osbourne of uh, heavy metal fame was the previous incumbent. Uh, before that, it was owned by Basil Dearden, the film director.